We still have plenty of time before the NBA trade deadline on February 10th. But can Monty McNair afford to wait that long to make the big move? As each passing game goes by, the Kings seem to get closer and closer to a top draft pick and further and further away from their goal of actually making the playoffs. On today's podcast, I'm going to be joined by host of the Kings Pulse podcast, Brendan Nunez. We're crossing over with some Sacramento Kings podcast coverage here to talk about that crossroads, get an idea of where Monty McNair and the Kings are at, how urgent McNair is to make a, make a mover if he can get away with waiting until the 10th. We'll also talk a lot about De'Aaron Fox, Tyrese Halliburton, the future of that partnership, whether or not it's the right time to move on from either of those two it's all on today's episode of the locked on kings podcast you are locked on kings your daily sacramento kings podcast part of the locked on podcast network your team every day and now ladies and gentlemen it is that time time for another episode of locked on Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all regular season and all off season. If you're looking for in-depth analysis, game-by-game -game breakdowns, highlights, interviews with local and national experts, full coverage of your Sacramento Kings from January through December, this is the place for you, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I've been a Sacramento Sports Media member for the last seven years. This is my eighth season covering Kings basketball, formerly for Sports 1140 KGDK Radio, now with ABC 10 News here in the California capital. And before I get to my conversation with the Kings Pulse's Brendan Nunez, very excited to have him back here on Locked On Kings. I really think you will enjoy it. I want to let you know that the uh, Locked On NBA uh, Network, the Locked On Podcast Network, we are putting on a NBA trade deadline show. The trade deadline itself is Thursday, February 10th at 3 o'clock Eastern time. Locked on NBA will be covering it live from 2 to 4 o'clock. Join Kim Becker, John Corrales, Locked on Fantasy Basketball host Josh Lloyd, and NBA veteran Antonio Daniels to get analysis of every blockbuster move. Subscribe to any Locked on NBA YouTube channel, whether it's the local teams or the actual Locked on NBA channel, our national channel itself so you get notifications on when that show goes live and of course any moves that the Sacramento Kings or other teams make uh, the local hosts including myself will be joining that show so I hope you will tune in for that very excited about that because I'm expecting the Kings to be active I'm expecting there to be maybe multiple moves at least a big move something uh, from the Sacramento Kings to happen before or on February 10th, and Brendan Nunez feels the same way. I think you're really going to enjoy my conversation today. Like I said in the intro, we talk about a ton of stuff, talking about this crossroads, talking about the pressure on Monty McNair, talking about trading De'Aaron Fox, potentially uh, the Kings choosing between going for the playoffs and uh, going for a top five pick, which is better uh, the better route for this Kings team at this point in time. A lot of stuff to get to, so without any further ado, here's my conversation with the host of the Kings Pulse podcast, Brendan Nunez. It's time for another Sacramento Kings podcast collab, and if we have to sit through and suffer what the Sacramento Kings are putting us through, we might as well do it together. So joining me here on the Locked On Kings podcast from the Kings Polls podcast, and of course, Kings Herald, it is Brendan Nunez back with me here on Locked On Kings. Brendan, man, I, I was talking a lot this week and been thinking more about every season has a crossroads, especially for the Sacramento Kings, where it gets past the point of no return. And a lot of times the Kings miss that point before making a decision or try and make a rash decision when they should be going in another direction. And where I wanted to focus on crossroads in my conversation with you today is we know that Monty, he said it in an interview, he and the Kings want to still push for the playoffs. That's still the goal, and I understand and appreciate that still being the goal. He knows, as well as we all know, that the Kings have to make significant improvements to this roster at the trade deadline or through the trade deadline in order for that team to make that happen. However, the trade deadline is February 10th. And here on January 23rd, with the Kings on a very tough road trip, they're on a three-game losing streak right now, there's a chance that we could get to the point where McNair makes a big trade and the Kings are already in such a big hole that no matter what they do, they can't really climb themselves out of it, even with how bad the Western Conference is. So my question to you to open this up, Brendan, are we at that crossroads, you think, right now? Or do we have a little more time before the Kings really have to choose between going for that playoffs through the play-in still or 
putting yourself in a position to finish with a top draft pick because the Kings right now are not far away from great odds at a top three pick. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on, Matt. I got just real quick. First of all, when you say, do they have more time? Do you mean time between like now and the deadline or you mean like um, more time being up until that point? I, I would say from now until the deadline, like if, yeah. can the Kings afford to go through this five game road trip? And then their two tough games after the road trip against Brooklyn and Golden State. Can they afford to go through these games? Maybe they pick up one or two, but will that put them in such a deep hole that the trade deadline won't even matter at that point? Yeah, I think that they can. Um, I mean, they're two and a half games out of the 10 seed. And I think that when it comes to uh, what you're, goal or you know we heard gentry a bunch of times this year say right that like we can still set out we can do what we set out to accomplish at the beginning of the year which i mean yeah i think we can have our opinions on whether what they set out to accomplish is uh maybe what you should actually be aiming for i would assume that's a postseason appearance um and i i think that that is still within reach um it, it could become out of reach i see what you're saying in this next road trip um but I think that just with the deadline and the way that these conversations probably work um, more likely than not, I feel like a lot of moves happen a little bit closer as teams get more and more, I guess you could say desperate. Hopefully that's not the category Sacramento falls into, but it wouldn't be surprising if that's where they're at. It does kind of feel like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't think that they can stand pat at the deadline. I feel very strongly about that. Um, which I think is probably a pretty uh, bland take that most people are at at this point. But, um, you know, ideally they would have made a trade a week ago when with a team like Indiana that already knows, all right, we have to change something too to also save this season. Um, but I, I don't think that like Philadelphia, for example, is in a position with Ben Simmons where they're like, we need to make it happen right now to save this season. Um, instead, they'd probably rather hold out until you're, and, you know, Maury knows that on February 9th, that is when he's going to get, okay, what are actually the most that these teams are going to offer? Um, so I, I think if if that means if making a deal prior or during this road trip rather than waiting to the deadline means that you're paying more, um, which is a hard thing to know, um, I guess impossible, then I'm against it. But either way, like I, I do think something needs to happen at the deadline um, maybe they're out of the picture, but at the same time, this roster should be good enough to keep up with the freaking Blazers, Pelicans, Spurs, but they should have been good enough to be better than them also. So who knows, really? Do you lean one way or another the Kings should continue this push for the playoffs through the play-in or the Kings should, for lack of a better term, tank for, for a draft pick? Do you lean one way or another between the two of those? Um, I probably if it was me making the a decision and what i would prefer i'd probably say a top five pick i mean it's i guess it might be a little bit different for sacramento but more often than not you're not in a position where you actually can at the deadline be like man we have a decent shot at the fifth worst odds in the league um and i get that doesn't exactly sound like an accomplishment but adding a top five player and i haven't dove into this draft as much as i would have liked to at this point in time um adding a top five player is that sort of top end talent that Sacramento needs to add to Fox and Halliburton. But I think I've kind of not even let myself quite have those conversations this year because it seems really obvious in the reporting that we've heard, um, seen a couple people mention the, uh, the wording of a playoff mandate being in place in Sacramento. So I, I've kind of taken myself out of even considering that as a possibility. If they go that way, I would be more than happy I um, mean, I think that you can keep Fox and Halliburton and still be bad enough. I mean, look at how bad they are right now, right? And if you remove Holmes, Barnes, for example, I think you go another tier down. Um, so I, I think that instead I've kind of fallen into how can you, I mean, Halliburton blew my mind this year of what his ceiling is. So now I'm kind of looking at it as, all right, you have two all-star caliber players, um, both with ceilings that I think are still undefined. I think we have a better idea of Fox's, but at the same time, he hasn't seen an ideal roster around him. Um, the absolute spiciest take I have that I've been scared to drop because I don't want to get all hot taked and come off as that guy or anything is that I don't know that <laughs> I have to preface these things. John Moran is a better player than De'Aaron Fox. Mm -hmm. No debate. I don't know how much better. 
I think a lot of it has to do. John Moran has had the same coach throughout his entire career. Fox is on coach three. Good chance he's on coach four next year. Um, the one year at Fox has never played with another player who has um, averaged more than four assists per game. Tyrese is the first guy. And he's played with bottom tier defenses. Memphis is consistently a top. They might have been 11th or 6th last year, but they're pretty close to top five defense these last two years. Um, so the way that you optimize a slashing, playmaking, elite athlete guard that's not good on defense is you surround them with defenders and shooters. And so again, Morant is better than Fox. I just don't know that I feel comfortable saying how much better because of the drastic chain, uh, difference in circumstances. Uh, the one year that Fox had some momentum under Jaeger, um, and there was a little bit of an identity, he looked great. And it's like, wow, we have some things we can move forward with here. Eh, actually, we're going to shake everything up, and Jaeger's gone, and we're going to bring in Walton. Like So because I haven't really let myself consider tanking or soft tanking resetting and focusing on optimizing the draft pick this year as a possibility, I've kind of turned to figure out how you can optimize these two guys that have all-star caliber. Uh, ceilings and potential and even if the kings shift their goal to that to me that does not excuse the failure of missing the playoffs if they do end up missing the playoffs i completely agree with what you're saying about De'Aaron fox and i know you wrote a lengthy article uh, on king's herald really going into detail about those that argument for fox which is crazy to think about if you had told yourself before the season started that you would have to argue for fox being the guy the right guy here in sacramento against fans I think everybody would have been shocked and surprised uh, to hear that, but that's where we are at this point in time. And I'm not saying Fox doesn't deserve the criticism that he's gotten, but I stand by what I said at the beginning of the season. Uh, I do agree that John Morant has surpassed De'Aaron Fox, but I also think that had Fox been given or earned the stage that John Morant shined on in the play in and in the playoffs last year, I think De'Aaron Fox would be much more of a household name than he is right now and have more of the, uh, the, the pedigree that we're seeing Morant rightfully earned. Today's episode of Locked On Kings is brought to you by BetOnline.ag. BetOnline would like to wish you a happy new betting year as we continue the march to the playoffs and beyond here in the NBA. The NFL playoffs, of course, are going on right now, and BetOnline remains the number one spot for all the best sports wagering for all of 2022. That's right. They've claimed the whole year already, and we haven't even gotten out of January yet. It's a new year, a new updated desktop and mobile website. If you sign up right now, you can receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. All you have to do is type in one word, locked on. Again, that's one word, locked on, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, to get started from football to basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Do not wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports. Bet online, where the game starts. I think uh, when carrying on uh, uh, the conversation about like the crossroads of going for the playoffs versus um, looking at a, 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 the odds at a top five pick, you mentioned the playoff mandate mandate and the key word there to me is playoff mandate, not postseason mandate, because I've stood firm by the idea that if Sacramento were to make the play in and not make the playoffs, you cannot consider that a success, even if it's considered postseason. The Kings played more than 82 games. Uh, and and my the way I've handled this conversation, at least for the last month, month and a half is do the Sacramento Kings belong in any kind of playoff, not postseason, playoff conversation based off of what we've seen? And the answer to me, Brendan, is, is clearly no, uh, watching this team right now. And I do appreciate McNair and the Kings still trying to go for it. I do think it is better for this team to try and make good with what they have now and figure it out than to just fold their uh, hand completely. But like we talked about to start this interview, their hand might be folded by the time they can make the move that they want just by, by pace of play and, and where they're at in the season at this point. Yeah, I think the, I, I mean, you know, I think they're still in a position where they can make the 10 spot and have some sort of feel good run, uh, which I, I guess that Sacramento might be the only place where you can call getting swept in the first round a feel good <laughs> run. Um, but I, I think somehow it would be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I'm with you. I mean, I, I think that they need to do more to really deserve serious consideration in that conversation. And the most frustrating thing is that like there were actual expectations heading into this year. I know there have been in years prior, but if you go 
from last year's roster compared to this year, there's so much more depth um, and, and not significant. And like um, when, when you look at the roster and the names on the roster, you're not like, man, this is a ridiculously talented, deep roster. But when you compare it to last year's where you're seventh, uh, like Glenn Robinson and Hassan Whiteside are getting rotation minutes. Um, there was just notable improvement and there. They feel like, they're not that much better than last year. Um, and it's the exact same things that we've heard from the beginning of the year that are still problems. Now I, I can't point to an aspect that has changed from the first game of the season in Portland compared to where we are now that has notably improved. That's that makes me feel better about this roster. I mean, we hear rebounding, we hear a lack of playmaking uh, pace is talked about nonstop and sometimes it just doesn't even happen. Uh, it feels like that's the one thing when you ask, like, what is the strength of this team? Gentry's like, well, I think we're really fast. I'm like, I don't know what that means, but okay. Um, I, I mean, I do, but I don't know that, that should be the strength of an NBA team. And it's like, that's the one thing you can identify and you can't even run. And all these same issues that we've heard at the beginning of the year are still here. The best they, basketball they played might've been the beginning of the year. Which and the sad. offense was supposed to be a strong suit that we were told not to worry about. And it was the defense that was the focus. And the offenses looked dreadful, not as bad as the defenses looked, but the offenses looked poor too, uh, especially when Tyrese Halliburton is not in the game, uh, which is a, a credit to Tyrese. And I'm going to talk a little bit more with you about De'Aaron Fox and Tyrese, the comparison between the two um, and how they complement each other more in just a little bit. But I did want to talk about the defense specifically back-to-back -back games where the Kings have given up 133 points in regulation. One to the Detroit Pistons, which is absolutely inexcusable. Not that 133 points against anybody is excusable. It's a little more understandable when you're playing the Milwaukee Bucks on the road. However, the Bucks were missing Giannis Hudson to Kumpo, and you still gave up 133 points. My thing is, if the Kings are able to still have a window to make the postseason, and they do pull off trades or are aggressive in the trade market, and there are options out there, is there... Are there enough guys or a guy or two, the names that they're searching for, big names, big splash moves that can come in and truly fix that problem? Because this defense is horrifically bad. The only consistency with this defense is that they're consistently bad. I think the only way it happens is if you're also under the belief that um, there's some addition by subtraction going on where it's like Buddy Heald and Marvin Bagley, and I'm not saying that Fox and Halliburton and even Harrison Barnes and Rashawn Holmes to a lesser extent are blameless in this issue, but Buddy and Bagley are two of the worst defenders in the NBA. Mm -hmm. So even bringing in just bad defenders rather than worst in the NBA maybe is some sort of addition by subtraction. This is the saddest conversation ever. Right. Um, <laughs> But it, or average to from where you're at with Buddy and Bagley, or maybe it means Davion gets more minutes. Um, so I, I think that you have to, if there is a journey to that, I don't know how much I buy into that, but like that factor would have to be really strongly believed in. And then when it comes to the guys available, like Jeremy Grant makes a decent difference. Um, Demontis Sabonis does not, uh, but then obviously Ben Simmons does, who it may be the best perimeter defender in the league um, and is also ridiculously versatile. So um, I, I think that if you're talking Simmons and or Jeremy Grant, along with like uh, Buddy and Bagley not being a part of Sacramento's roster anymore, that I don't know that you're coming a good defense, but maybe you can be 20th instead of 27th or wherever they're at right now. <laughs> What a low freaking bar. It's so sad. Yeah. But really, that's the truth is this team, if they could get to just 20th defensively, how much of a difference could that make in the win column? And we've still yet to be able to answer that question. Well, I know uh, you've been defending De'Aaron Fox and, and rightfully so. And I'm not trying to put you in a position to say um, give up on that take or anything like that. Everybody, I mean, when you have a team that this bad, there's nobody on this roster that you can say is untradeable. Uh, I understand you're less willing to move on from De'Aaron Fox in a Ben Simmons type deal than other uh, than other Kings fans and people who follow the Kings are. And I, I can put myself in that same category. So what are some names and we're talking realistic names here or maybe unrealistic names? And that proves your point. What are some names that you would be willing to move De'Aaron Fox for players that you'd say this is the ha the type of package or the type of piece? Kings have to get back in order for moving on from De'Aaron Fox to be a correct move. Yeah, interesting. Um, I, I mean, I think the obvious 
obvious one for me would be uh, just a willingness to f- prioritize uh, acquiring talent through the draft. You know, like if you are shipping off Fox because you want to get younger and build more of a timeline around Tyrese. Now, I think that Fox can be a part of a timeline with Tyrese, um, but if that's the, I also understand getting even younger than what Fox is, um, then that's the most obvious for me. But if we're talking players, I mean, I honestly don't hate Fox for Simmons. Like, I, I think that I more so, and I, it's probably the thing I got the most, uh, like up in arms, confused, and maybe let my emotions make me rant a little bit too much about this Fox stuff. Um, but a lot of it was me more so um, arguing against, uh, I feel like there had been a couple people in a, in a few days saying the Kings have to trade De'Aaron Fox. And I just don't think Fox is like, Fox is a really good player. Like what we talked about with the Morant and difference in circumstances. Um, I, I, do, I think it's too early to say he can't do X, Y, and Z. Um, it's too early to say he can't fit with Halliburton, but it's also too early to say he can. I'm still not a hundred, Still not all that confident in that duo um, when it comes to being competent on defense. But um, it's more so that Fox, if you are capitalizing on an, on a situation of a player, outlier player being available, and I think Ben Simmons falls into that, I do not mind De'Aaron Fox being on the table. Uh, my issue was it's not like you should be waving around, hey, we're trying to f- trade Fox. Um, so... Maybe it needs a little bit more from Philly's side. Maybe it doesn't. Um, I actually don't really mind doing uh, Ben Simmons. I weirdly don't hate Jalen Brown. Um, I don't know that Boston is there, um, but that sort of thing. Like I, I, it's one of those things. I'm just really glad that I'm not the one making that decision. But if those sort of deals were made, um, I think I could pretty easily talk myself into it. This Locked On Kings podcast brought to you by our friends at Built Bar, and they truly are a friend of mine. My reliance on Built Bar is, I'd say, unhealthy. It's basically an addiction, but thankfully, Built Bars are healthy. So if you're going to get addicted to something, it might as well be something that is good for you. And Built Bars are good for you because not only uh, do they help put on protein, uh, add that muscle weight, help you lose weight as well. Uh, you are also getting that taste, that enjoyment, that sweetness that you get out of eating your favorite candy bar. Built Bars can replace your favorite candy bar, believe me. And whether it's it's trying the mint brownie bar that I love, if you're a fruit fan, uh, like the our raspberry bar or our um, orange bar, if you are a fan of like uh, hearty stuff or big chocolate lover, first off, all these bars are covered in 100% chocolate, but we also have like double uh, stuff brownie bars. Uh, I think there's a chocolate chip cookie dough bar, or at least there was for a time being. There's so many flavors available for you to try right now. If you go to built.com, use promo code uh, LOCKED15, you'll get 15% percent off whatever order you get i highly recommend you ordering a mixed box so they'll send you a box of all of their uh, different flavors or at least a, a majority of their flavors for you to try out then once you pick your favorite bars uh, you can go back on the built.com uh, and make sure you order the bars and the boxes that uh, that have everything that you want specifically really easy to do you probably will become just as addicted as i am so fair warning to you but you won't be disappointed again this promo code locked 15 for 15 percent off at built.com watching Tyrese Halliburton lead this Kings team when Fox was out in health and safety protocols. And then last night, and of course the Kings don't have a winning record in that circumstance at all, but Tyrese has played really well. He stepped up as both a scorer and continued to be the facilitator that the Kings need him to be versus these handful of games that Tyrese Halliburton was out because of health and safety protocols. De'Aaron Fox was still good, but you saw a significant drop off in overall team production, especially offensively. And there's no argument that the Kings are better in the half court, specifically when Tyrese Halliburton is on the floor. There's no player on this Kings team that is better in the half court than Halliburton is. That includes De'Aaron Fox. And it's really not close. I also don't think it's a debate right now that De'Aaron Fox is a better player than Tyrese Halliburton. He absolutely is. However, I do think it's up for debate that Tyrese Halliburton is a more important player to the success of the Sacramento Kings than De'Aaron Fox is. Do you agree with that or do you uh, push back on that a little bit? I think that especially when you're factoring in their contract situations and Tyrese just being in his second year compared to De'Aaron just starting his extension, which is still four more years after that, like 
they're close enough to me when I'm measuring up potentials that that is going to swing it in Tyrese's favor. Um, and honestly, like I would probably put Tyrese as the most valuable guy. Um, you know, for me, it's less of it went with that duo. It's less of can how is Tyrese affected by De'Aaron? Because I think Tyrese fits in every situation. I think mm-hmm. his game is extremely versatile. He is going to make an impact in, no matter what you ask him to do on the offensive end. Um, we've seen him have games where him and Fox are both playing well. Uh, in college, I mean, Tyrese was the feature guy on that team, but there was a lot of times he was playing off ball as well. Tyrese can be versatile on the offensive end. The question is more so, can De'Aaron work well with another? Uh, I know that I said he needs another good passer alongside him, but Tyrese is beyond a good passer. Tyrese is go- going to be, if not weirdly already, one of the best passers in the NBA. Um, Fox said the other day at practice that Tyrese is easily the best passer he's ever played with in his career. Um, so I think that that's more of the question when it comes to the fit. And uh, De'Aaron just, I think, deserves some time to kind of learn how to do that. Um, but I, I think that factoring in what I think is a somewhat similar ceiling, which I almost feel like I'm crazy for saying that with how Fox is, and it's only the second year for Tyrese, but Ty has blown my expectations away, like I said. Um, Yeah, so factoring in similar ceilings, the age and contract situations that they're both facing, and how seamless, how easy it is to build a roster with Tyrese Halliburton as your number one compared to De'Aaron Fox as your number one, like, both of those guys are going to need another guy next to them of each other's talent level. Um, but Fox needs that potential needs more specific skill sets. Tyrese, you can put whatever around. So that's why I lean Tyrese. Yeah. I feel pretty confident in saying that if the Kings were to choose between the two of them, that they would take Tyrese Halliburton. It wouldn't be without hesitation, but I'm pretty sure they would come to the same conclusion that you and I uh, have here. I also have no hesitation in saying, and no doubt in my mind that if the Kings were to trade De'Aaron Fox, wherever he would go, he would shine. And that would be something that the Kings and Kings fans would have to live with for the remainder of De'Aaron Fox's career more, uh, more likely than not. Um, that's just the reality of the situation here. I am. I still believe it can work between the two of them. However, do the Kings and more importantly, Monty McNair in this current front office, do they have the timeline to wait? Can they survive waiting to make the two of them work and make those marginal pieces and marginal moves versus trying to make the big splash that we believe Monty is looking for um, right now? So we'll wrap up with this, Brendan. February 11th gut uh gut shot or gut reaction your your what trust in your gut here does this team look mildly different drastically different or is this the same roster for the most part on february 11th i think it's drastically different um i don't have any sort of great feel or any sort of sources or anything like that um but i just feel like it has to you you can't roll out this same thing um I, I think they end up getting Simmons or Sabonis. I mean, I, I think that those teams need pieces. I think that Buddy and Barnes are a lot more impactful than than uh, some people realize, especially probably people in Sacramento, because they're. it's like, oh, well, they've been a part of a bad team for so long. And it's like, yeah, but there's a difference when you're asked to be the number three guy compared to the number five or number six guy. Um, so I think those guys are can be impactful on good teams, and Sacramento's draft picks are really, really valuable. Um, I've been surprised by a handful of people on Twitter being like, oh, no, they're not that valuable. They're never like at the top of the lottery. They're only in the middle of it. I'm like, they're, so they're in the lottery every single year is what you're saying. Like, um, so I, uh, I think there's a big change. I say uh, Simmons or Simonis. Also wouldn't shock me either if the Kings end up making a handful of moves that we've heard absolutely nothing about because that's how it seems to happen uh, every time during the, the trade deadline is some move swoops out of nowhere. Maybe that will be the uh, the Sacramento Kings is something that Monty McNair uh, can pull off. Well, Brendan, keep up the fantastic work that you do over at Kings Pulse. I know you'll continue the, the conversations with the build up to the trade deadline. If anything goes down, you'll cover it there as well as uh, we will cover it here on Locked on Kings and of course all the work that you do over at the Kings Herald. Uh, I appreciate that as well. Thank you so much for joining me, my man. We'll do it again soon yeah thanks for having me on matt keep up the great work yourself man it was a pleasure having brendan on we talked about a, bl- a lot of stuff and now we want to hear from you if you have any thoughts on uh trading De'Aaron fox keeping De'Aaron fox keeping fox and halliburton together your choice between the two of fox and halliburton whether or not monty should continue to push for the playoffs or whether the Kings should put themselves in a position for a top five pick and with that top five pick who do you want the kings to target 
We can talk about it all. You can reach me on Twitter at Matt George Sack. You can email me, Matt George Sports at gmail.com, or feel free to leave your th uh, thoughts down in the YouTube comment section down below, of course, if you're watching on YouTube. Appreciate all the support as always. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you the guests that I have scheduled for next week on Wednesday, even though the Kings play that night. Uh, we're not going to have a podcast that has anything to do with that game because I am scheduled to be joined by the Athletics, Sam Amick. He will be joining me here on the Locked On Kings podcast. Of course, Sam has his fingers on the pulse of what's happening in Sacramento. He is really the national reporter with roots deep here in Sacramento and the Kings organization. Uh, so he knows a lot of what's going on and he'll be able to fill in some of the blanks for us. If you have any questions specifically for Sam that you'd like me to ask, be sure to reach out to me and let me know what those questions are and make sure you tune in for that interview because it's going to be really really good i cannot wait for that again that's happening on wednesday and then wednesday night's game i think the kings play atlanta that night we'll talk about that game on the thursday episode uh, of the locked on kings podcast or at least that's the plan for right now but sam amick on wednesday we have it scheduled please join me then of course join me for every episode of locked on kings i appreciate you whenever you do i appreciate you for just being a kings fan and fighting through this season with me even if you have to take an episode or two off i understand as long as you keep coming back. Love you. Thank you so much for your support. I'll talk to you soon. Until next time, my name is Matt George. You've been listening to Locked On Kings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network.